we are now going to discuss the different sources of South African education law, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Common Law and the South African Schools Act. The Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, Act 108 of 1996, where does the Constitution come from? As we all know, there was a need for fundamental constitutional change in South Africa for many years. A lot of conflict during the 1980s led to the unbanning of political organizations and in 1990 and then to the return of these leaders. Multi-party talks, the Cortesa negotiations, were held where the majority of political parties and organizations undertook to draw up a new democratic constitution for South Africa. This was done through negotiation by all different parties and resulted in the adoption of an interim constitution, which took effect on the 27 April 1994. The election for parliament and the new provincial legislatures took place from 26 to 28 April 1994. Final constitution was adopted by a two-thirds majority in parliament on the 8 May 1996. And the final constitution, Act 108 of 1996, took effect on the 4th February 1997. Where does the constitution fit in? The constitution is the supreme law of our country and is therefore the most important document in our legal system. The Constitution is protected and enforced by independent courts, such as the Constitutional Court. These courts can even find the President of the country guilty of failing to act in accordance with the Constitution, and are thus very powerful. Not even Parliament can pass laws that are not in line with the Constitution. The, the Constitution of South Africa represent the collective wisdom of all our people and has been arrived at by general agreement. It can therefore be said that our constitution is the cornerstone of our democracy. The Bill of Rights. The Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, Act 108 of 1996, consists of 15 chapters. The Bill of Rights can be found in Chapter 2 of the Constitution. This chapter forms the heart of the Constitution and consists of 32 sections. Sections 7 to 39. The life of every South African is affected by the fundamental rights, human rights, included in the Bill of Rights, which brought a new dimension to legislation by its strong emphasis on values. To whom do these fundamental rights, human rights, belong? If we look at the term, Human rights, it actually tells us that these are the rights that everyone has because they are human, referring to these rights that are naturally due to every person. The Bill of Rights pro protects the individual from abuse of power by the state. It therefore determines the relationship between the state and individual. Keep the Bill of, of Rights with you while we are working with the fundamental rights because we are going to refer to and discuss specific sections and subsections. When one refers to a particular part of, for example, the Bill of Rights, it is done as a follows. In terms of Section 29.1a, everyone has the right to a basic education including adult basic education. See if you can find it in your copy of the Bill of Rights. In the school situation, it is very important for every educator to be well informed about the Constitution and especially the Bill of Rights, as well as other legislation concerning education. Educators must know their rights and duties, are, as well as those of the learners, the parents, the governing body, and the Department of Education. The relationship between the rights and obligations. It is very important to note that people do have rights, but they also have duties or obligation concerning these rights. A right is something a person is entitled to. You, as an educator, have the right to receive a salary for teaching or managing at your school for doing your job. But you also have a duty. You have to teach the learners according to what is expected by, from you by the Department of Education and to the best of your ability. You can therefore claim your right to a salary after you performed your duty. A right is usually balanced by a duty. 
It is also important to know that rights may be limited. Limitation of rights. Fundamental rights are not absolute, as their boundaries are set by the rights of others and by the legitimate needs of society. In the school situation, we can take the following example. A learner does not have absolute freedom of expression because the other learners and, and educators also have a right to privacy and confidentiality, and these have to be respected. The code of conduct of the school must also be adhered to. Turn to the first section of the Bill of Rights, Section 73. Here it is stated that all the rights in the Bill of Rights are subject to certain limitations referred to in Section 36 of the Constitution. Sections important for education in the Bill of Rights. Section 36, Limitation of Rights. Turn to Section 36 of the Bill of Rights and read it carefully. Here we can clearly see that the rights in the Constitution may be limited if these limitations are reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on fundamental values such as human dignity, freedom and equality. When limiting rights, the following factors, according to Section 36, should be considered. The nature of the right, the importance of the limitation, the nature and extent of the limitation, the relation between the limitation and its purpose, less restrictive means of achieving the purpose. Some of the rights have built-in limitations. In other words, the formulation of that right itself implies a limitation. This means that everyone is entitled to that right, but only if they do not exceed the built-in limitations contained in that right. For example, Section 29.2, of the Bill of Rights provides for education in, in the official language or languages of choice where it is reasonably practicable. This implies that one cannot demand to be thought in a specific language if there are good reasons for that not to be possible. Other built-in limitations are found in sections 16, 17, and 32. Although most of sections in the Bill of Rights are important for education, a few of the most relevant sections will be discussed in more detail. Section 9, Equality. Various conflict situations in education are the result of misunderstandings regarding to the right to equality. It is therefore necessary to study the following section well. Turn to the Section 9 in the Bill of Rights and read it carefully. This heading can be misleading and can easily be interpreted to mean that everyone is equal. In Section 9.1, it is important to note that everyone is equal before the law and therefore has the right to the equal protection and benefit of the law. This right actually implies that all people can claim equal treatment and equal opportunities. It therefore protects the rights of persons not to be discriminated against. It is important to know that Section 9.2 does allow for affirmative action. However, differentiation, fair discrimination to treat people differently is not prohibited as long as it is reasonable, justifiable and fair. It is impossible to regulate the affairs of people without a differentiation. People need to be treated differently and must therefore be put into different categories. A school will need to have separate toilet facilities for boys and girls, for example. All educators do not receive exactly the same salary. Another example is that pensions are allocated on the base of age. Are these examples of discrimination? Is it unfair discrimination? The concept unfair discrimination refers to a situation where people are treated differently without justification. Read section 93 carefully. As a discrimination based on a ground specified in this section would be presumed unfair unless the contrary is proved. Discrimination on the basis of race, gender or disability are examples of discrimination that impair the fundamental dignity of human beings and is usually unfair. Section 10, Human Dignity. According to Section 10, everyone has inherent dignity and the right to have their dignity respected and protected. For educators, this right implies that they will always treat learners as human beings through their use of language, through their actions and through their attitudes.
Learners should understand that through their conduct towards educators and fellow learners, they must show respect and recognition for everyone's human dignity. An important aim of any code of conduct should be to promote respect for oneself and others and to ensure the right of everyone to their dignity. Care should be taken when administration punishment not to infringe this right by belittling learners, name-calling, and by humiliating learners in front of their peers. Section 12. Freedom and Security of the Person. This section deals with freedom of security of the person and should actually be read with Section 10, Human Dignity, and Section 14, Privacy. The part we are dealing with in Section 12.1, CDE, reads as follows. Everyone has the right to freedom and security of the person, which includes the right to be free from any form of violence, not to be tortured in any way, and not to be treated or punished in a cruel, inhuman, or degrading way. This last subsect D leads to the abolishment of corporal punishment in public and private schools, as stated in the South African Schools Act, which will be discussed later. Section 14, Privacy. Read Section 14 carefully. This section may have the consequence in school that educators may not search the possession of a learner, for an example, dangerous weapon, may not search a learner's possessions, for an example, a school bag for drugs, may not intercept and read a learner's letters. This activity will help you to think about some of these ideas might mean in practice. Two members of the Learner Representative Council tell the deputy principal of the school that they suspect a specific grade 11 of selling drugs to learners on the school grounds. After consulting the principal, they decided to watch the boy very carefully. One morning before the school, the boy is caught selling four white tablets to a younger boy. The two boys are taken to the principal's office, where the principal and the deputy confronted the older one first. The boy tells then two educators that the younger boy had hit each and that he gave him for hit his tablet that he had in, in his pocket. They search his pockets and find 42 tablets in a plastic bag. The deputy principal identifies them as a demented tablet and then calls the police. Do you think the boy's right to privacy is infringed by the principal and the deputy head? It must always be kept in mind that no rights are absolute and so all may be limited. Educators will have to make absolutely sure that they have a sound reason for limiting a learner's right. An example we can mention here is to protect other learners. According to Section 24, which will be discussed later, everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being. The property of learners may therefore be searched if there are reasonable grounds for the search and provided it is done decently. This section also implies that everyone has the right to a life with a minimum of interference. This concerns private, family, and home life. How does this affect the private lifestyles of educators? One must remember that educators are in a profession that carries a great responsibility. The parents expect an educator to serve as a role model for their children. This gives rise to the question, whether limitation can be placed on educators' lifestyle and contact. One must always keep in mind that the rights of the educator must be balanced against the school and the learner's best interests. Restriction can therefore be placed on educators if their conduct and behavior are detrimental to the learners and the school. Sexual harassment. Unwanted attention in the employment environment is an example of invasion of privacy. You suppose you know that some educators in management positions misuse their authority to gain sexual favors. This happens, for example, where principal expects sexual favors from female educators in exchange for some kind of benefit. In some cases, educators might even bribe female learners with exam papers in exchange for as sexual favors. This kind of behavior is seen as a serious form of misconduct in the school or in any other work situation and can lead to dismissal. 
This is a matter of great concern, and the learners must be protected against these things. Section 15, freedom of religion, belief, and opinion. Section 15.1.2 stated that everyone has the right to freedom of conscience, religion, thought, belief, and opinion. This section can be read with Section 7 of the South African Schools Act. According to the Schools Act, religious observances may, may be conducted at a public school under rules issued by the governing body. If the observances are conducted on equitable basis, an attendance at them is free and voluntary for learners and members of staff. Section 16. Freedom of Expression This section provides for the right of everyone to have freedom of expression. This section also has a built-in limitation. Section 16.2. Read this part carefully. Ask yourself the following question. To what extent can educator and a learner's freedom of expression be limited? When exercising one's freedom of expression, one may not infringe upon other people's rights. In the education situation, this right may be limited in accordance with the competing rights of other individuals. For an example, their right to human dignity and so forth in the best interest of education. Section 17. Assembly, Demonstration, Picket and Petition. This section stated that everyone has the right peacefully and unarmed limitation to assemble, to demonstrate, to picket, and to present the petitions. In the school situation, it is necessary for educators to so exercise this right in a way that the learner's right to education is not violated. The learner's right of assembly and demonstration may also be limited, and clear rules should be drawn up concerning mass meetings. Section 23, Labor Relations. Section 23 one stated that everyone has the right to fair labor practices. In other words, the right to be treated fairly in the workplace. Section 23.2 ABC is also important and stated that every worker or educator has the right to form and join a trade union, to participate in activities of a trade union, and to strike. Again, it must be kept in mind that the learners right to education is not be violated. Section 24, environment. According to this one, has the right to an environment to, may I repeat again? According to this, everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being. This means that the educator and the learner have the right to a safe school environment. The Occupational Health and Safety Act stated that every school must compile a written safety policy and that educators have the responsibility to take adequate precautions to prevent accidents, possible injuries, and damage to school property. According to the common law principle in local parentas, the educator acts in the place of the parent, and this duty of care determines that he or she should foresee possible dangers to learners, take steps to prevent injury or damage and to see to it that these steps are carried out. The Occupational Health and Safety Act, Act 85 of 1993, each school is expected to have an, an effective safety program which complies with all the requirements set out in the Occupational Health and Safety Act, Act number 85 of 1993. With a reverence to this act, schools have certain duties. Each school must compile a written safety policy, which must be made available to every educator. Each principal and educator must, as far as possible, work together to create and maintain a safe, risk-free environment for staff and learners. Each educator should take reasonable care of his or her safety and that of the learners who may be affected by his or her actions or his or her failure to act. Unsafe conditions must be immediately identified, reported, and avoided by taking the necessary precautions. Every educator must carry out any legal instruction issued in the interest of health and safety. Principals of schools with more than 20 staff members must appoint safety representatives in writing for a specified period for designated areas such as a workshop, laboratory, sporting facilities, and the transport of the learners. All educators have the responsibility to take adequate precautions to prevent accidents, possible injuries, and damage to school property. 
Concerning the last provision, it means that the parents have the right to claim damages from the school or educators in cases where learners are injured or when their rights have been violated through the actions of the school or individual educators. Section 28, Children. Turn to section 28 and read it through carefully. This section provides children with certain socioeconomic rights. Children are also accorded to the right to family and parental care, and the state has a duty to ensure that the child is provided with these basic requirements. Section 28D clearly stated that children must be protected against the ill treatment, neglect, abuse, and humiliation. Here, the duty of care of the educator plays a role. The common law principle in local parentas to act in the place of the parent applies here. According to the Child Care Act, Act 74 of 1983, educators are in a good position to identify child abuse or molestation. They have a legal duty to report any form of child abuse to a police officer, social worker, or a, the child welfare. Section 28.2 further stated that a child's best in, interests are of paramount importance in every matter concerning the child. In the application of this section, a child means a person under 18 years of age. Section 29, education. Section 29 stated that everyone has the right to a basic education, including adult basic education, and to further education which the state, through considerable measures, must make it progressively available and accessible. Section 29.2 makes provision for everyone to have the right to receive education in the official language or languages of their choice in public educational institutions where that education is reasonably practicable. This implies, as already mentioned, that one cannot demand to be thought in a specific language if there are good reasons for this not to be possible. To ensure the effective access to and the implementation of this right, the state must consider all reasonable alternatives, including single medium institutions. This must be done by taking into account equity, practicability, and the need to redress the results of past racially discriminatory laws and practices. The right to education depends on a balance between the responsibility or duty of the parents and learners on the one side and the state or other providers of education on the other. Here we have an example of a right being balanced by duties. Section 32, access to information. According to this section, everyone has the right of access to any information held by the state and any information that is held by another person and that is required for the, the exercise or protection of any right. This section also has a built-in limitation. This right does not mean that the learners and educators automatically have access to all information in the possession of the school authorities. Access to information may be requested when the rights of individual or a group is threatened and the information is required in the exercise of that right. One should always ask the following questions before releasing any information about, for example, learners. Why does the person need this information? Is the information necessary to protect the learners' rights? Would this information be used to the benefit of the learner? Section 33, just administrative action. This section 33 implies that everyone has the right to administrative action that is lawful, reasonable, and procedurally fair. A hearing will be procedurally fair if both parties have the opportunity to present their case before an impartial person. There are many school situations concerning educators and learners that include just administrative action, just administrative action also related to the due process, referred to in the South African Schools Act, which protects a learner's right to be heard, which will be discussed later. The learner and the educator's right to be heard is also protected by the common law principle of natural justice, which includes let the other party also be heard. This activity is designed to help you to think about some of these principles mean in practice. Mrs. Sunkosi is appointed in a governing body post at a primary school. 
Her salary is paid from school funds, and he is therefore in the service of the school governing body. She is responsible for teaching grade four class. One of the boys in her class tells his mother that she used a sway weight in the class. The next day, his mother reports her to the principal of the school. He is very angry to hear of such unprofessional conduct of the newly appointed educator. He calls her to his office and tells her that if he receives any further complaints about her from parents, she, she will be immediately dismissed from her post. Mrs. Sungos is very unhappy because she did not use the sway weight. She cannot afford to lose her post because she is the breadwinner and has two children to care for. She feels threatened. Were any of Mrs. Sungos's human rights violated by the principal's conduct? The rules of natural justice provide for the application for the following principles. The person concerned must be immediately informed of possible steps to be taken against him or her. The educator or a learner should be informed of what he or she is being accused. The person should then be given the opportunity as well as sufficient time to put forward his or her side of the story, preferable in writing. When a decision is reached as to which appropriate disciplinary measures should be taken, reasons should be given for the decision. The body in authority should never be prejudiced in dealing with any disciplinary matter. The following circumstances are regarded as a prejudice. Monitoring gain for the decision maker, personal interest such as a familiar relationship, a negative attitude toward the accused. The decision maker should devote sufficient time to the matter and take only relevant facts into account. For an example, financial and political matters may not be taken into account if the suspension of a learner is being considered. Every post or position in education has certain powers attached to it. A person in a certain position may not act outside the limits of his or her authority of powers. Or everyone must be aware of his or her his respective functions and must take care not to interfere with the duties and area of responsibility of others. Duty to attend school. Turn to Section 31 of the South African Schools Act and read it carefully. This section stated that it is the duty of every parent to ensure that every learner for whom he or she is responsible attends school from the first day of the year in which the learner reaches the age of seven until the last school day of the year in which the learner reaches the age of 15 years or the ninth grade, whichever occurs first. It is the duty of the parent, not the child, to comply with this provision. Throughout the act, the parent is given the following expanded definition. The parent or the guardian of the learner, the person with legal custody of the learner, or a person who has undertaken to fulfill the obligation of the parent, guardian, or a person with legal custody. It is the parent's duty to see to it that their children attend school every school day. If learners do not attend, plain truants, and so forth, their parents must be informed because of their legal responsibility. Because of the obligation created for all children to compulsor, uh, complete nine years of compulsory education, South African Schools Act provided that every MEC must ensure that there are enough school places for all children of compulsory school age in his or her province. Should the children of compulsory school age fail to enroll or attend a school, the head of department has the power to investigate the circumstances of the absence, take appropriate measures to remedy the situation, and as a last resort, issue a written notice to the parent requiring compliance with his or her obligation to ensure that the learner attends school. Exemption from compulsory attendance. A head of department may exempt a learner entirely, partially, or conditionally from compulsory school attendance if it is in the best interest of the learner. Every head of department must maintain a register for all learners exempted from comparable school attendance. A parent without just cause fails to ensure the attendance of a learner at school is guilty of an offence and liable on conviction to a fine or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding six months.
Case study of a learner who has been absent from school for six weeks. Imagine you are an educational leader in a multicultural school. Mrs. Jones is very upset. The boy in her grade 11 class has been absent from school for six weeks. Mrs. Jones wants your advice. Because the boy has not written any test and the school has not been notified about his reason for his absence. What would you tell Mrs. Jones? There are two fa factors which could influence the action the school take against this boy, his age and the policy of the school. If the boy is 16 years or older, he no longer has a right to basic education and could be asked to leave because he did not notify the school or write any tests. If he is younger than 15 years, the school is obliged to follow the stipulations laid down in the South African Schools Act and the regulations of the Department of Education and report his case to the relevant authorities. Parents, learners, educators, and others cannot expect the state to give everything and do everything for the school. After all, parents and members of the community are often in a best position to see what the school really needs and what the problems in the school are. That's why all these people can play a meaningful role in the school. Representative Council of Learners According to Section 11 of the Schools Act, a representative council of learners must be established at a school and enroll in learners in the 8th grade and higher. At the beginning of the year, the RCL has to elect the learners who are to be members of the governing body. Learner participation in the management of schools is stressed as being crucial for the creation of a climate of effective teaching and learning. It is seen as an integral part of the process of learner development. Functions of the RCL. The RCL has made day-to-day -day duties. These are the building of the learner unity. The RCL needs to encourage all learners to take part in discussions and activities and to get involved in projects and campaigns, addressing the needs of learners and acting in their interest, keeping learners informed about events in the school and in the community, developing a relationship with the educators to help solve problems between educators and learners, working with parents by supporting each other. Learners and parents empower and lift each other, linking with other schools in area to discuss pro, uh, common problems and share ideas, linking with other organizations such as the youth groups, civic organization, and trade union. Suspension and expulsion. Suspension can be defined as a temporary refusal of admission to a learner to a school or the hostel of a school. Usually, suspension precedes expulsion. Expulsion is a permanent removal of a learner from a school. According to Section 91 of the Schools Act, the governing board of a public school may suspend a learner from attending the school after a fair hearing. This can be done as a correctional measure for a period not longer than one week or pending a decision as to whether the learner is to be expelled from the school. Section 92 stated that a learner may be expelled only by the head of the department if found guilty of serious misconduct after a fair hearing. The learner or the parent of the learner may appeal against the decision of the head of the department to the member of executive council MEC. Can the principal of a school suspend a letter from school? If the principal suspends a learner, he is acting beyond his or her power. Only the governing board of a school may suspend a learner. Remember, the common law principle of natural justice and the basic right to just administrative action are very important to protect the learner's interest. They prescribe a process that ensures a fair hearing before any disciplinary action may be taken against the learners. This process is called the due process. Due process. The South African Schools Act makes provision for the due process, including a fair hearing. Before a learner may be suspended from the school by the governing body, due process guarantees a learner a fair hearing before a learner may be suspended for a period of one week or be expelled from the school by the head of the department. Any learner alleged to have violated any rule that may require suspension or expulsion must be brought to the principal. 
the principal shall hear the evidence and then decide on the action to be taken. Such action must include that the principal must inform the parent in writing for the proposed action and arrange for a fair hearing by a small body. This tribunal must not be intimidating to the learner. In the case of very young learners, special arrangement must be made for the hearing and the parents or guardians could represent the learners. The district committee so appointed must conduct the hearing in accordance with the, the provincial regulations laid down by the member of executive council. For the hearing, the learner must be informed of and understand the charges of which a written notice should be given at least five days before the time, also indicating the date, the time, the place of the hearing. Receive such particulars on the charges as he or she may be entitled to according to law if he or she so request. Get the opportunity to be heard and tell his or her side of the story. Prefer, uh, pre present the irrelevant facts. Not to be prohibited from being represented by legal counsel, in which case written explanation of the charges must be given, or in less serious cases, the learner may be represented by a member of the RCL, parent, guardian, or educator, be heard by an, an impartial person or persons, be treated with dignity during the process, be informed in writing of the decision of the governing body on whether or not he or she is guilty of misconduct and the penalty to be imposed in the case of suspension or expulsion and have the right to appeal to the MEC if he or she is aggrieved by the decision of the governing body. This tribunal must not be intimidated to the learner. In the case of very young learners, special arrangement must be made for the hearing, and the parents or guardians could represent the learners. The disciplinary committee so appointed must conduct the hearing in accordance with the provincial regulations laid down by the member of executive council. For the hearing, the learner must be informed of and understand the charges of which a written notice should be given at least five days before the time and also indicating the date and the time of the hearing. Receive such particulars on the charges as she may entitle to according to the law if he requests. Get the opportunity to, he to be heard and tell his or her side of the story and to present the relevant facts, not to be prohibited from represented by legal counsel, in which case the written explanation of the uh, must be given or less serious cases, the learner must be represented by a member of RCL, parent, guardian or educator, be heard by an impartial person or person, be treated with dignity during the process, be informed in writing of the decision of the governing body on whether or not he is or she is guilty of misconduct and the penalty to be imposed in the case of suspension or expulsion, have the right to appeal to the MEC if he or she aggrieved by the decision of the governing body. The governing body must keep a record of the proceedings of the hearing and may inform in writing the head of department of its decision to suspend a learner or must inform the head of department within 24 hours of its recommendation for expulsion of the learner. The governing body must keep the record of the proceedings of the hearing and may inform in writing for the head of department of his decision to suspend a learner or must inform the head of department within 24 hours of his recommendation for expulsion of the learner. Offenses that may lead to suspension. Provincial regulations must be consulted in a compilation of a list of offenses which may lead to suspension of a learner. Offenses that may lead to such suspension include but are not limited to the following. Conduct which endangers the safety and violates the rights of others. Possession, threat or use of a dangerous weapon. Possess a new transmission or visible evidence or narcotic or unauthorized drugs, alcohol, intoxicants of any kind, fighting, assault or battery, immoral behavior or profanity, falsely identifying oneself, harmful gravity, hate speech, sexism, racism, theft or possession of a stolen property, including test or examination papers prior to the writing of tests or examination, Un or unlawful action, vandalism or destroying or defacing the 
school property, disrespect, objectionable behavior, and verbal abuse directed at ed educators or other school employees and learners, repeated violation of school rules or the code of conduct, criminal and oppressive behavior such as rape and gender-based harassment, victimization, bullying, and intimidation of other learners, infringement of examination rules, and knowingly and lawfully supplying false information or falsifying documentation to gain an unfair advantage at the school. Serious misconduct. Serious misconduct, which may include offenses according to the law, must be investigated by the police and referred to the court if necessary. Serious misconduct must be handled in terms of the, gov of the government notice and regulations promulgated by the member of executive council in the provincial gazette of the province concerned. Should a governing body have difficulty to, to interpret these guidelines, they must please contact the head of the department of, of the province in which their school is situated. The role of the governing body in admitting learners to public schools. According to South African Schools Act, the following is applicable. All public schools must admit learners and fulfill their educational requirements without unfairly discriminating in any way. The governing body should formulate and write the admission policy of the school. The admission policy may not conflict with the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. Section 52 of the South African Schools Act clearly stated that the governing body of a school may not administer any test related to the admission of learners. The governing body's role in determining the language policy of a school. South Africa is a multilingual country with 11 official languages. The Constitution, Section 29, stated that everyone has the right to receive education in the official language of his or her choice in public schools where such education is reasonably practicable. According to the South African Schools Act, the governing body may choose the language to be used for teaching and learning in a school. In deciding on the language policy, the governing body must comply with the Constitution and the South African Schools Act and the relevant laws of that province. The language policy may, for example, not be used to keep learners out of the school on the basis of race. Factors that may play a role in deciding on the language policy of a school language preference of the majority of learners and parents, number of learners who ask for instruction in another language, other schools in the vicinity and their language of instruction, available space at the school, ability of educator to teach in a particular language, cost involved. The governing body's role in protecting the learners' right, uh, religious rights in the school. Section 15 of the Constitution guarantees both personal freedom of conscience and religion and the right to conduct religious observances at state and state-aided institutions, provided that these observances are conducted in accordance with the rules. They are conducted on equitable basis and attendance is free and voluntary. Section 7 of the Schools Act stipulated that, subject to the Constitution and any applicable provincial law, the religious observances may be conducted in, in a public school schools in accordance with the rules issued by the governing body. If such observances are conducted on equitable basis and attendance is free and voluntary for both learners and members of the staff. The governing, the governing body, together with all stakeholders, must lay down rules which ensure that learners and staff with different religious convictions have an equal opportunity to attend religious observances according to their faith. The role of the governing body in adopting a code of conduct for a school. Good discipline is one of the key characteristics of an effective school. Without discipline, effective teaching and learning cannot take place. All public schools are required to have a code of conduct or discipline policy. According to Section 8 of the Schools Act, a governing body of a school is expected to develop a code of conduct for the school. The task of developing a code of conduct is also listed under Section 20 of the Schools Act as a one of the compulsory functions of the school governing bodies.
The code of conduct of the learners must be developed through a consultative process and it must meet the legal requirements set out in the various national and provincial education acts and regulations. I thank you.